Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's ARL webcast. Submit a question or comment at any time during the webcast. Please click on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Submit button. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Prue Adler. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patrick. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the ARL webcast on the substance and implications of the recent decision in the lawsuit over Georgia State's University's e-reserve program. I am Prue Adler, Associate Executive Director of ARL, and I will be moderating today's session. Joining me today are Jonathan Band of Policy Bandwidth and Brandon Butler, Director of ARL Public Policy Initiatives. Jonathan helped shape the laws governing intellectual property and the Internet through a combination of legislative and appellate advocacy. He has represented clients with respect to the drafting of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Pro-IP Act, the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, and other federal and state statutes relating to intellectual property and the Internet. He is also legal counsel to the Library Copyright Alliance. Members of the Library Copyright Alliance include ARL, the American Library Association, and the Association of College and Research Libraries. Jonathan is an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University Law Center and has written extensively on intellectual property and the Internet, including the books Interfaces on Trial and Interfaces on Trial 2.0, and over 100 articles. That gives new meaning to scholarly communication. Jonathan received a BA magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, in 1982 from Harvard College and a JD from Yale Law School in 1985. Brandon's responsibility include analysis and advocacy regarding copyright, privacy, surveillance, free expression, and telecommunications. He also writes the ARL Policy blog and the ARL Policy Twitter account. He is a proud alumnus of the University of Georgia, has an MA in philosophy from the University of Texas at Austin, and a JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Before working at ARL, he was an associate in the media and information technologies practice at the law firm Dow Lonis in Washington, D.C. Our presenters will recap the basic facts of the case and the key holdings in the decision, discuss the possible next steps in the litigation, and suggest some of the possible consequences for libraries when making decisions about how best to implement a fair use policy in the context of course reserves. Midway through the webcast, we will take a break for questions and leave time at the end, as well for Jonathan and Brandon to respond to questions from you. This webcast will be archived through Infinite Conferencing. After the upcoming long weekend, it will be available through ARL's YouTube channel. Please check ARL's website for a link. And our collective thanks to Tricia Donovan for getting this um, set up for us. Let me now turn to Brandon and Jonathan. Brandon, over to you. Thank you very much, Prue. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's our pleasure to be with you today to talk a little bit about this uh, decision that we've all been waiting for for a pretty long time now. Um, so it's finally out. And I want to first give you kind of a big picture uh, what, what just happened, right? What's the, what's the big idea here? Um, what are the big takeaways? So first, this is the first federal decision to apply fair use to these, this kind of nonprofit educational use in the Internet age, right? We have not had a case on point yet until now. Um, this is a high-profile defeat for the publishers um, who have been on a long campaign on this issue and who favored a draconian standard uh, based on the 1976 classroom guidelines that would limit uh, the use of these resources dramatically. Um, but instead, they lost big time on 94 out of the 99 infringements that they alleged. Uh, this decision is not binding, however, on libraries, on other libraries, and on, or on other courts. Uh, only Georgia State University is bound by the outcome of this case, but it is a very long, um, meticulous treatment, and so it's going to be a useful input for folks who are deciding what to do next. Um, the framework that uh, is outlined in this decision generally favors libraries, but there are some important caveats uh, to that. And finally, and this may be the most important thing to remember, there is more to come in this case in particular and in fair use in general, right? This is only a district court decision. Uh, there could be an appellate court decision. And this is a decision about one subset of issues, and there are many other issues still um, hot and interesting and, and, frankly, undecided in the courts. So this is a fascinating decision, um, but it's one decision, and it's the beginning of a decision, really. 
So uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Jonathan to get us started with background. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Um, so just to give you a sense of the background of this dispute, uh, the, the, the subject, the, the court centered, the case centered on uh, e-reserves. Um, so of course, you're all familiar with the, the general notion of uh, course reserves, which are typically administered by libraries, and then you, you separately have uh, course websites, which are often administered by professors. In this case, again, dealt with the course reserves uh, administered by the, the library rather than uh, than course uh, course software. Um, now, as you all know, there's this well-established practice of uh, students being able to visit the library uh, to check out uh, supplemental materials that are on reserve. So even when I was uh, in college, uh, you know, 30 years ago. You know, I'd be able to go to the library and and uh, check out um, a, a photocopied chapter uh, of a book uh, that the, that the professor had put on reserve. Um, now, what what uh, universities have been doing? Again, you you know all this that they've been uh, uh, with the technology now. They've been uh, switching from sort of the physical uh, course reserves to electronic reserves. Um, however, publishers have uh, objected to that movement generally from the physical reserves to the course reserves. Uh, they, uh, as a practical matter, see it as cutting into their revenue from uh, things like course packs, uh, which again, you know, there's always the sense, you know, course packs typically have sort of the required readings, whereas the reserves have supplemental readings. Uh, and, and there's been a series of sort of very acrimonious discussions over the years between publishers and various universities and threats of lawsuits. And typically, um, after the threat, after the saber rattling, uh, people sit down, cooler heads pre prevail. Uh, there might be some tweaks to the uh, university's uh, uh, e-reserve system, and, and uh, uh, people go merrily on their way. Um, here, however, what happened is is there was that, and uh, uh, but but the, the, the parties weren't able to res resolve their differences, and so uh, litigation ensued. Um, uh, even though the named plaintiffs were uh, uh, Sage, uh, Cambridge University Press, and Oxford University Press, the uh, the through discovery it turned out that the people actually paying for the litigation were. Uh, the uh, American Association of Publishers and uh, CCC, the Copyright Clearance Center. Uh, so they were actually paying for the litigation, um, and and it cost uh, several million dollars. Um, and and it's important, and we'll talk about this a couple of times later. But it's important to know that that after the litigation began, Georgia State changed its policy uh, and adopted a policy that was much more similar to some of the policies that other universities uh, adopted after sort of this dance that I described with uh, with the publishers uh, and nonetheless the litigation continued now the in the litigation there were two core issues um, a highly technical issue of uh, state sovereign immunity um, which we'll talk about and then uh, very briefly and then the much more uh, the sort of detailed substantive discussion of the fair use issue. So I'm going to uh, just give you the outcomes in a nutshell, right? So how, what is the ending to this story, uh, just in case we all get struck by lightning before the discussion ends? On immunity, the court said that because Georgia State is a public institution, it can't be sued for damages over things that happened in the past. The only relief available is that officers can be ordered to stop violating federal law going forward. So it's all about the future, and it's not about money. It's about behavior. Um, on fair use, Georgia State's policy was found to be a good faith attempt to uh, follow fair use. They weren't faking it when they wrote the checklist. And there were only five infringements shown versus, again, the 99 alleged. Um, and the second finding on fair use was that the policy did fall short. The court determined that a 10 percent one-chapter rule uh, was appropriate under the third factor, and the policy did not include such a rule. And so the court was uh, the court felt that the policy is probably going to have to be changed in that regard. So that's the nutshell. Now we'll talk a little bit in more detail. <laughs> 
On the uh, state sovereign immunity issue, again, this is a very technical issue. Uh, it comes out of the Constitution that uh, state entities can't be sued uh, unless uh, they waive their immunity. Uh, but at the same time, there's this principle that you can still get uh, injunctive relief against uh, state officials acting in their official capacity. So as Brandon said, uh, you know, the case wasn't really about damages uh, the way it evolved. It was instead uh, focusing on this uh, state uh, sovereign immunity issue. Um, and, and, uh, and again, only with respect to the new policy. The court wasn't concerned about what happened under the old policy because you had a new policy. Uh, if this was a normal case where there were damages available, you would be looking at the old policy. But since this new policy came into place, the only issue was uh, uh, whether the, 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 the lawfulness of the new policy. Uh, the, again, the technical issue with, with um, sovereign immunity is you have to make sure you name the right plaintiff, and so you can't sue the university itself. And actually, in an earlier round of litigation, the court found that, you know, that the, 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 you know, the, the, the publishers can sue Georgia State University. Here, in this, in this decision, the, the question was whether, you know, the, the, the publishers had sued, um, you know, very high-level officials in the university, and so the question was whether they were the right uh, uh, defendants or you actually needed to have people who, who were more involved in the administration of the e-reserve system, you know, such as the, 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 the library director or someone of that sort, someone who was much more hands-on, as opposed to uh, higher-level officials that really don't get their hands dirty uh, in the infringing activity. Uh, the court here found that, that because the issue was sort of the policy and the administration of the policy, that these high-level officials were the right or the appropriate uh, defendants. Um, and and uh, uh, and so the, the the litigation could proceed uh, with uh, with respect to those defendants. Now uh, the other issue, as we talked about, is fair use, um, and uh, you you of course are all uh, familiar with the four fair use factors, and and we'll be walking through them uh, and talking about them in much more detail. It's also worth remembering that that the, the four factors are. Uh, not an exhaustive list. The court is able to consider other factors, and in fact, here the court did raise other factors, and, and we'll be getting to that in a minute. Now, uh, just one last point before we actually start talking about what the, 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 how the court handled uh, these four issues. It's important to sort of, again, to, to the bigger picture. There was this large e-reserve system, and sort of the publishers uh, again, the, AA, uh, the AAP and the CCC sort of helped choose three publishers that were going to go forward with the litigation. And from that universe, they, they, you know, they, they sort of looked at all the e-reserve, all the excerpts on e-reserves, and came up with the list of, of 99 that they actually brought forward at trial. So there was uh, – Georgia State had uh, you know, probably thousands of excerpts uh, over the, the, the years, the two years that the policy was in place, but the trial proceeded only with the 99 excerpts selected by the publishers. Presumably, they, they, these were what they thought, thought were their strongest cases, um, and, and, uh, and, and from that, the litigation proceeded. Um, and, and now we can turn to how the court uh, applied, uh, applied the, uh, the four factors. So under the first factor, the court is asking, what is the purpose and the nature of the, of the use, right? What's the character of the use? What are you doing, you the user? And uh, this often includes an inqu inquiry into whether the use is transformative, um, but it also asks under the first factor, the, te the text of the statute talks about criticism, commentary, teaching, educational use. Um, so there, there's some guidance as to what kinds of purposes fair use is really interested in. And the court was persuaded by the language of the statute, um, both the preamble of Section 107, which is a preamble to the whole statute, not just the first factor, and the text of the first factor that, that what Georgia State was up to here, the sort of spreading of knowledge, the educational enterprise, criticizing and commenting on past culture in the context of teaching, is really at the heart of fair use. Um, 
And for that reason, the first factor always strongly favors fair use um, in these kinds of e-reserves cases. Um, this was a really important finding uh, because the publishers asked the court instead to find that Georgia State was doing just what commercial copy shops had done um, in creating course packs that were to be sold for profit, um, and that they were doing just what uh, the Texaco Corporation had done when they were making copies of articles in support of their for-profit research. And the court refuses to uh, accept that analogy and instead says there is a real and very significant difference between these for-profit uses and a free nonprofit educational context. Um, so, so that's a really big finding for, for the educational uh, users out there. Now, she does not find that the use is transformative, which has been a dominant consideration in modern fair use law for the last couple of decades. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, but that turns out to be not a, not a major issue because she finds the first factor favors us uh, quite strongly every time um, anyway, regardless of it not being a transformative use. So the next factor uh, that the court looked at uh, was, you know, the second factor was the, the nature of the work. Um, and uh, uh, here, the, the, the case law generally indicates uh, that if it's a fact work, it gets uh, it, it, that, that way, the factor weighs in favor of the user. On the other hand, if it's an expressive work, that factor weighs in favor of the rights holder. And so the question here was whether these works were fact works or expressive works. Um, the publishers took the, took the position that they were expressive works because they were, you know, sort of, you know, there was text, uh, uh, and it was, a, and they were said that a fact work should be, for purposes of the fair use analysis, should be li limited to things like databases, which are copyrightable but don't have any real uh, expressiveness. I mean, what they do have, they have expression in the selection, coordination, and arrangement of the facts, but they don't have sort of the, 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 anything that reflects uh, the, uh, the, the express, they don't have expression of the author in terms of text. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the Georgia State, on the other hand, argued, no, that, that a fact work means is, is in essence something, a non-fiction work. Uh, uh, whereas an expressive work would be something more fictional, uh, a novel uh, or something of the sort. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the publisher said, yes, but if you do it that way, you're not, you know, you, 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 you denigrate the, the difficulty uh, of, of writing these, uh, these nonfiction works and you, you, uh, uh, and, you know, you don't, you don't recognize all the hard effort that goes into the sort of the expression that a, that a, that a professor might put into writing uh, a, a nonfiction work. And the court said, well, you know, the, the copyright law isn't about protecting effort. Uh, that's, that's sort of sweat of the brow. That's not, you know, that, that's not what we're doing here. That's not what the point of copyright is. And moreover, we're not saying uh, that, that – uh, you know, we're not saying that, that, that the, the, the expression doesn't get any protection. It's simply how do we weigh this specific factor? And so the court said this specific factor, uh, non-fiction uh, 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 non scholarly work, is considered a fact work, and so that factor tips uh, in favor of the user uh, and away from the rights holder. So we've got, a, we've got two factors out of four so far that we're going to favor the library every time, um, but now we're into uh, more interesting waters here. The third factor will favor publishers if the amount taken is greater than 10% for works that have fewer than 10 chapters total, or greater than one chapter for a work with 10 chapters or more. Um, so. That, on its face, is a little bit disheartening, but let's walk through the reasoning here. The, the first thing that happens in considering the third factor is that the court decisively rejects the use of the classroom guidelines, which is a huge victory and, um, you know, 
not a huge victory in the sense that there was any chance of our losing it. Um, I, I think it's a pretty clear uh, it's pretty clear from the legislative history that the classroom guidelines are not the law, um, and the kind of authority that they have is is not a mystery to most people. But the plaintiffs, nevertheless, asked the court to impose the classroom guidelines, which set really extraordinarily limiting uh, uh, boundaries on the amount that can be considered fair use. Um, and the classroom guidelines also suggest that uh, repeated use across semesters is not going to be fair. And the court rejected both of these kinds of uh, arbitrary limitations. She has a nice long discussion of what the classroom guidelines really were, um, which was a private negotiation between a few parties in the 1970s, um, which came to a very limited safe harbor. And she reasonably moves on from there to not give them much weight at all. Um, she also, uh, to determine how much uh, is, is a fair amount to take, she has to ask, well, what is the whole work? If we're going to talk about what portion of the work is a, is a usable amount, we need to know what is the whole work. And she decides that the work is the book, um, not individual chapters even though that in some cases each chapter in the book will have a separate author. Um, and that's a, I think that's a really interesting and important finding. Um, and she also says that the whole, the work includes the index and the front matter. So it's, it's every page from the cover, from the front cover to the back cover. Um, so that also favors fair use and favors library use because you have a larger whole from which you're taking. Um, but she does say that because the use is non-transformative, um, the amount has to be decidedly small and narrowly tailored to a legitimate purpose. So uh, she sort of looks into a crystal ball and asks, well, you know, what can be decidedly small in this context? And she looks at some cases and sort of distills this number, um, these 10 percent, one chapter kind of number. Um, but I think it's important to note that this is only with respect to the third factor. So unlike the classroom guidelines and some of the other guidance that's out there, that says essentially if you take more than 2,000 words, it's not fair use. What the judge is saying here, and it plays out when she actually makes a decision, um, is that if it's more than 10 percent, that weighs against you on one factor out of four, but she's still going to weigh the other factors. And so um, it is not the end of the discussion, which is, I think gives it a little bit more nuance than um, the kind of trump card role that numbers often play in the fair use context. Uh, so that brings us to the uh, fourth factor. Um, and, and the court there uh, said that uh, the fourth factor favors publishers uh, if a license is reasonably available at a reasonable price for excerpts in a convenient format. Uh, so that's um, uh, again, on its surface, it sounds not so great, but then when you sort of look behind it, it, it actually is, is, is not as problematic as it would look. Uh, you know, the court, in, in performing this, the, the, the analysis of this factor, you know, asked the question, would widespread fair use substitute for the purchase of the underlying work? And the court, as a general matter, found no, that, that especially to the extent that you're taking uh, relatively small amounts of uh, chapters, uh, 10 percent, that that really would not harm uh, the, the, the market for the book, in which case you need to then look at, at the licensing market. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the court was talking about, you know, recognize that there is a uh, licensing market, but it, it, it was very careful to say the only market that it cares about is if, if there is a market for excerpts uh, and uh, in electronic form. And so it actually eliminated many of the uh, of the books uh, because uh, uh, excerpts were not available electronically, uh, uh, or their licenses were not were not available for uh, excerpts in electronic form. Um, and so that really narrowed the universe uh, of of instances where this fourth factor uh, weighed against uh, fair use. Also. Um, uh, it's important to note that the, you know the court did uh, mention several times this notion of reasonable price, and and so that could be uh, a factor in in future cases. So so these are this is how the court looked at the four uh, factors that that we're familiar with, the four statutory factors. The court also 
indicated that there were additional factors that needed to be looked at, uh, needed to be considered. Uh, and, and in many respects, uh, you know, this is uh, maybe the most interesting part of the decision, certainly uh, for, for copyright lawyers, because the judge uh, had a lot of interesting things to say here. Um, first, she, she uh, uh, noted that the fair use of excerpts here would have absolutely no effect on the author's incentive to create. Um, uh, at least the, the academic authors whose works were being used in the e-reserve system, uh, you know, she noted that they, they had all sorts of other motivations, you know, the uh, prestige, advancement of knowledge, tenure, and so forth. And so she really didn't think that uh, the use of excerpts would have any negative impact on incentives to create. She also looked at the incentives for the authors to publish. Um, and, and, you know, she, uh, uh, and, and she did a lot of analysis of what, and, we'll, and Brandon will show you some slides later on, about what percentage of the revenue uh, of the publishers was represented by these uh, licensing fees, and she just found that they were uh, minuscule. And so, so she sort of just uh, looked very negatively on... Um, uh, on this, uh, on, on on the arguments that the publishers made about how how these you know the use of excerpts and the manner that Georgia State was was doing would 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 put them out of business, even if everyone around the country were doing the same kind of thing, uh, she she just didn't think that that was a, a very credible argument. And uh, I must say, especially reading this section of of the decision. You know, kind of reading between the lines, uh, you, you know, you, you almost get the sense of the judge scratching her head and saying, you know, why are we here? Why is why is this litigation ongoing, um, given that, that that so little money is at stake? Um, finally, uh, she talked uh, in, with respect to this factor. Uh, she talked about um, how uh, fair use in this instance will promote the dissemination of knowledge and the further the purposes of copyright. And, and here what she did, um, you know, she did something very clever. Uh, uh, as, as many of you know, recently there was the Golan versus Holder decision, and uh, one of the arguments, you know, that had to do with sort of pulling works that were uh, in the public domain back into copyright. And one of the arguments is, is how, how is it possible that sort of pulling public domain works back into copyright, how could that possibly uh, provide an incentive for authors to create? Um, and, and the court sort of made this, you know, the Supreme Court made this kind of, you know, this argument is saying, well, we're not only, you know, the goal of copyright is not only to create works, but it's also to uh, promote the dissemination of works and the dissemination of knowledge and sort of by bringing things back into copyright, then that provides uh, authors and publishers with an incentive to distribute works that were previously were not distributed. And so I think she sort of flipped that on its head and said, okay, well, if you say that distribution of knowledge and the dissemination of knowledge is such an important purpose, well, then fair uses that accomplish that goal, uh, that, 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 tape, that tips in, uses that accomplish that goal, that tips in favor of the fair use analysis. So I think it was sort of like a, a clever uh, legal jujitsu that she did to sort of flip the reasoning of the Supreme Court uh, in the uh, uh, in in the other direction. So, so we have an idea now of how the framework uh, looks, right? This is her overall. This is the first 90 pages out of 350 of what Judge Evans was thinking. And so, how did she then, in the remaining, uh, you know, 260 pages, apply this framework to the Georgia State uh, system of course reserves? Well, the first thing she asked for every work, so she, she analyzed uh, 75 excerpts, and I'll show you a little slide later on to talk about how things kind of got winnowed down. Um, but she, she looked at 75 excerpts, and the first thing she asked was, um, before I even talk about whether, you know, before we even get into fair use, the publishers need to tell me that they have a reason to be in court right now challenging this with respect to this work. They need to explain that they own the copyright in this work. And there were actually a lot of um, excerpts where the publishers couldn't prove that they owned the work that they were suing over. 
Um, so there were, you know, it was it was quite common that it would be a, a book with, you know, edited by a couple of authors, but then with contributions by, you know, the author of each chapter. And they would have the agreement with the editors, but not the agreement with the chapter authors. And the court just tossed those claims without even getting into fair use. Um, because to make a to, to to get into the courthouse door, as it were metaphorically, you need to prove that you have a right, and the publishers couldn't make that make that showing, which says something about what we can what we can expect in the future in terms of orphan works. That is, there's probably um, an even bigger universe of works out there than anyone is willing to think about, um, <clears throat> where ownership is going to be um, disputable, where people will not be able to prove what they own. Um, the next category where uh, the court just didn't even get to the fair use question, um, she applied a doctrine called de minimis non curat lex, right, which is the law doesn't concern itself with little things. Um, so there were these uses where uh, the teacher would post something, and we probably are all too familiar with this phenomenon, but nobody read it, right? And if the teacher posted a, uh, if the professor posted an excerpt or asked librarians to post an excerpt, and GSU could show, using the logs uh, from their course reserve system, that only you know only the professor and the librarian ever looked at the file. Um, then the judge would say, "Look, there's no harm here, right? Nobody ever saw the copyrighted work, so I'm not gonna. I don't care whether there was fair use or not because nothing happened um, that's significant." Um, so that was another. Uh, sizable chunk of works where she said, look, who cares what happened here because there's no harm. Um, the third factor that really came into play in knocking a lot of these works out of consideration and, and flipping the analysis in favor of Georgia State was that in many cases, licenses for digital excerpts just were not available. So if the plaintiffs come and come to the court complaining that we're entitled to make money here but the court found that they weren't on the market, she wasn't going to hear their complaint, right? That's, that flipped the fourth factor in favor of the library, and they already had factor one and two. So factor one, two, and four favor the library, and that was the end of the discussion. Um, and then the, the final thing that colored the analysis throughout was that, frankly, professors were generally being pretty modest and reasonable in the amounts that they were asking for. So the amounts were almost always under one chapter or 10%. Um, so, you know, the professors were more or less intuitively getting it right, even though this kind of bright line that Judge Evans drew, um, you know, they had no they had no way to know that that would be the bright line that she drew, but they were coming to that conclusion anyway. Um, so in the end, right, as we said, there were only five infringements found, and it, the problem in each of those five cases um, was that it turns out there was a license, and it turned out that the library used more than she thought was reasonable, and that was it. Um, but otherwise, in the vast majority of cases, um, the uses were modest, or the publisher was not in the market, or both. And so it was overall um, a big victory for Georgia State. OK, so the question is, what happens now? Um, in terms of the specific case, uh, uh, the 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 judge ordered uh, the publishers to propose relief. What what they want? What 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 they want with their in terms of injunctive relief with respect, at least to the five works, um, and, and the court uh, the, the publishers need to provide that by the end of this month. And then Georgia State has uh, uh, another couple of weeks to uh, reply, and then the court will give a final order. I imagine. What uh, the, 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 the publishers will do is propose not only order, uh, injunctive relief with respect to the five works at issue, but they will propose changes to the Georgia State policy to, uh, to comply with the court's analysis. Uh, and I'm sure they're, they're going to grossly overstate what the court said. Um, but, but it could be that the, the, the ultimately what the court will do is say, okay, the policy needs to have some language about, uh, 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 you know, that, 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 that uh, with respect to the, you know, about how the court, how, how professors should apply the fair use analysis, and that with respect to the third factor, you know, it will, it will have language about this 10%. Uh, one chapter idea, and with respect to the fourth factor, it will say something about uh, 
uh, the availability of, a, of an electronic license. Uh, so I imagine likely that's where the court will end up. Um, will there be an appeal? Uh, we don't know. Uh, uh, our understanding is that Georgia State is unlikely to appeal, but the publishers very well might. Um, with respect to libraries, what should libraries do? Uh, we can talk a lot more about that later, uh, in especially in the question and answer period, but I, I think it's important to stress, first of all, the case isn't final, right, because it, there might be an appeal, and at that point, you know, who knows what the, uh, what the, the, the Court of Appeals will do. Uh, hopefully they would uh, um, either affirm the, the, the court's decision entirely or, or even uh, come out with something even more favorable and say that the, the judge's 10% uh, 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 one-chapter rule might, might uh, uh, be too stringent. Um, but again, we, there's no way to know uh, what would happen on appeal. Uh, and the other point, uh, as Brandon mentioned, this case is only binding on uh, this decision is just binding on Georgia State, um, uh, and and is not, uh, and, and we're, we're, it might have some persuasive weight on courts uh, in other jurisdictions and other libraries. Uh, you know, it would just be, you know, it's a one district court decision, and uh, and and, and it's, a, it's a valuable data point, but it's uh, certainly uh, not the final word in, in this. Um, uh, not, not the final word on this issue. Well, let me jump in and, and um, try and get some questions from um, our uh, participants today. Brandon, there have been a number of questions asking about whether this decision means anything for the use of images, video, audio, um, and if not, what does it mean in terms of use of journal articles? What is your speculation about the implications there? I think that's a great question, and you know, if I, I have to sort of try and read the court's mind a little bit and psychoanalyze, and I hope you'll indulge me. But you know, the reason this opinion looks the way it does is clearly shaped by the fact that it's all about chapters of scholarly books, right? She doesn't she doesn't think twice about the question of whether these uses are transformative because. It's books, the kind of books that people read when they're in college. You know, there's really this isn't this doesn't look like the kind of case where you might think about transformativeness. And this whole question of 10% or one chapter really doesn't export well, right, to the images or the, to the audiovisual context. I mean, what's a chapter from a movie, and and why would you limit a cha a, a movie or a, or a song to 10%? Um, so these, I think, this decision, the application of this decision beyond scholarly books would be very strange um, and really kind of a stretch. Um, so I think it's, it's still kind of wide open territory for those categories of works. Um, I think you're, when you're trying to deal with using works other than scholarly books, um, you're going to have to look to all the same resources you've been looking to so far. I hope you'll look to the Code of Best Practices. Um, and you know, let's find out what your community is doing and what they think is a rational way um, to attack these problems. Um, but I think honestly, and I, I just can't imagine the judge disagreeing very strongly, that she decided the case before her, and that case was about academic books. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who send in questions, a number of them are going to be answered in the next half of this webcast, so just hold tight, we'll get to them. Um, we have another question asking um, from someone in a private university. The concern is that a great deal of what was in favor of GSU is due to GSU being a public university. How might this have been different for a private university? Well, I don't think the fair use analysis would have been any different if it was a private university. I think it would have been um, uh, exactly the same. So the sovereign immunity issue, that was uh, uh, helpful to uh, 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 to, to Georgia State, and it also uh, it, it limited what was the scope of the case as a practical matter to the new policy and not the old policy. And apparently, under the old policy, there was a lot, you know, much larger excerpts were used uh, that may have had more of an impact on the market. Um, and so, uh, uh, if you, you can imagine that if this was in the private university context, uh, maybe. There would have been uh, the, 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 
plaintiffs could have sued for damages with respect to that older policy. Uh, but, you know, again, we don't even know what the court would have done with that older policy or, or, or exactly what was going on there because the court only looked at the new policy. Um, and, and, and the fair use analysis with respect to the new policy uh, applies the same to uh, private universities as, as well as, uh, as, it, as it does to, uh, uh, to, to, to state institutions. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we have another question which is going to ask for some speculation on both of your parts, so I'll let you both figure out how you want to weigh in. It asks, uh, how do you feel, that pub what were the publishers trying to accomplish by bringing this litigation against Georgia State? Do you suspect that publishers will continue this practice or will the ruling make a difference? Uh, let me just jump in there uh, first. I think. You know, of course, uh, I don't represent the publishers, so it's hard to tell what they were thinking. And especially, you know, I can see that they really didn't like Georgia State's uh, original policy um, uh, because it was probably uh, more flexible and looser than the policies uh, of many other universities and certainly than the policies of some of the other Universities such as Cornell, where you know the the as I mentioned, the publishers had done some saber rattling, and then people sat down and and kind of came up with a framework that uh, that everyone could live with. But once uh, Georgia State, in essence, adopted something, uh, my impression is it's virtually identical to what Cornell and some of the other universities have. At that point, you know, I I I was bewildered that they continued to litigate. I I just don't get it. Um, uh, and and um, it, it could it could very well be that they just decided that they wanted to shut this thing down, or they felt that professors were not uh, applying it uh, rigorously enough. Or another thing that you know, another speculation is that uh, what they wanted to do is to say. Uh, they, they didn't like the notion of all of these professors sort of uh, or even, you know, individual librarians making fair use determinations. Uh, they, you know, it could very well be that the, the, what they ultimately were looking for was a system where the fair use determinations would have to be made by uh, the general counsel's office. Um, and I think they just figured that between having lawyers doing it and, 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 and the, the resources that would be required for lawyers to do it, that, that as a practical matter you'd have a lot less, uh, 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 you know, much less uh, uh, material being included and much uh, in, in e-reserves and then, and then much more, much more uh, material being licensed. So I think that that was their ultimate goal was not necessarily to shut the whole thing down altogether, but to make it to, to sort of make it so much more burdensome on institutions that uh, uh, there would be uh, uh, a shift towards uh, more licensing, and especially things like the CCC blanket license. And I think that that's why they uh, were willing to fund the litigation. In terms of whether they'll do this again, I, I think not. I mean, they spent a lot of money and uh, have very, very little to show for it. And so I think they're going to have a very hard time uh, convincing, uh, uh, you know, I, I think they're going to have a very hard time uh, 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 pursuing this, this kind of uh, litigation strategy again. Thank you both. Why don't we go back so that we have ample time for the rest of the, um, the slides and then additional questions at the end. So back over to Jonathan and Brandon. Okay. Thank you, Prue. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the, the question then is, is you know, uh, sort of like stepping back, you know, where are we and, and, and where do we go from here? So, so uh, th there's a lot of good news here, uh, as we've indicated. Um, uh, and, and I think even though uh, the, 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 the court's approach might have been, you know, more mechanical than uh, some of us would have liked in terms of sort of, you know, kind of this, uh, uh, you know, sort of very almost mechanical three, you know, you know uh, 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 march through each factor uh, and, uh, and, and sort of like, you know, counting, you know, you know, Two factors versus two factors, three factors versus one factor, which again, um, uh, you know, you might not be exactly reflecting the, the, the sort of the, the cutting edge uh, thinking on fair use. Um, 
uh, uh, it's still, uh, it's really, really easy to get to three factors. So even though, you know, we might want to say, gee, you know, the first factor should overwhelm everything, you know, because of the educational use, so you don't really need to look at everything else. Um, I think as a practical matter, it's, it's very, you know, the, as Brandon said, you know, the libraries automatically get two uh, and as, as a practical matter, and then it's really easy to get to that third, either by having just one chapter or by uh, if, uh, if, if the material isn't available, uh, if the excerpt isn't available for license. And so as a result, it's, it's, you know, this as a practical matter is pretty generous. Also, the ties uh, when, uh, you know, can be resolved in favor of libraries. So even if um, uh, you use more than one chapter and an excerpt uh, is, is an electronic uh, licensing, uh, a license for electronic excerpts is available, uh, you still, uh, those other factors that I talked about do come into play. The court at that point would look, you know, how important was licensing revenue uh, for the publisher with respect to this work. And so even in, in these two two ties, it could still tilt towards the library. Um, and, and finally, the final piece of good news is that, uh, as Brandon indicated, you know, kind of the classroom use guidelines and the requirements, not only you know, which have these very limited number of words, you know, like 1,500 words, and, and the whole issue of spontaneity, the notion that you needed to, you know, you could only have the material for one semester if you need if you're going to use or one class if you're going to use it again then you needed to get a license you needed to get permission uh, you know that whole notion and, and I know that, that that this whole spontaneity thing has sort of permeated the educational world but the court basically just just said you know you know they had no patience for that whatsoever and I think that that's uh, you know good riddance to spontaneity <laughs> Indeed, good riddance to bad rubbish. And so, uh, so uh, there is some not as good news in this decision, right? So, uh, one thing is, of course, that the numerical limit under Factor Three is is arbitrary, right? I mean, there are just there are going to be times when two chapters makes more sense than one chapter. Um, you know, you can imagine uh, you can imagine that a book that books in the future will be arbitrarily and and artificially inflated in terms of the number of chapters just in order to to game the system that Judge Evans has described. Um, you know, fair use has never been um, a numbers game, um, and so it's it's strange to see a number in, it's play such a prominent role in the analysis, all, even though it's ultimately not a trump. Um, the, uh, the court gets transformativeness all wrong. Um, she just literally says, uh, as plaintiffs, uh, even though plaintiffs argue that this use is non-transformative, or even though this use is non-transformative, parentheses, a mirror image uh, of the excerpts is used, close parentheses, it's still fair use. And I appreciate that it's still fair use, but there is literally no analysis whatsoever in terms of the transformativeness question. She just doesn't take it seriously, um, and that's an absolute mystery. It, is, it has been a hugely important concept in fair use law, and she just rolls right past it. Um, and then finally, the, there's a real circularity in the fourth factor, right? If you read the decision when she discusses the market harm and the effect on the market and so on, you know, she's, again, as we'll see in just a minute, extremely impatient with the con with the idea that there's real market harm here. I mean, there just is not real market harm. But she has this but she can't she can't pass over the fact that copyright is supposed to be control over copying, and she thinks that that should somehow get an extra bit of weight. And so she says, well, if you're out there trying to exert control via a license, that should count for something. Um, but that would that's that's circular, right? Because every fair use is a use that is being done despite the fact that a an owner could, in theory, demand a license. Um, so you know, it, it's it's a, it's very circular, and, and I think anybody that's thought much about fair use will be driven somewhat insane by this idea of the fourth factor um, just automatically flipping if there's a market um, there as an initial matter. Although, as Jonathan said, she goes back and revisits and looks a little deeper in these tie cases. 
So that's the not as good news, but let's not end on bad news. Let's talk about numbers um, because the numbers are very interesting. So the court told us a lot um, about the harm that publishers suffer from course reserves. Um, the first thing is just we should, we should really see, I, I wanted to give you kind of a graphical representation, right? There is a whole universe of posted excerpts on the Georgia State system. Who knows how many, but many, many. Um, and the publishers got to cherry pick 99 that they challenged, right? So they presumably picked their best case. And of the original 99 that they alleged were all infringing, the average amount taken was 9.6% of the work. Right? We know that from the judge's decision. Uh, there's a footnote. And then uh, they, the publishers just decided that they would only submit 75 for final determination. They gave no reason. The court said, well, I'm only going to look at 75 because the publishers decided they didn't want me to look at the other uh, you know, 24 or whatever. And, uh, but we know, again, from a footnote that what that change did was to bump up the average amount taken. So we can infer that what they did was drop all the one-page excerpts, right? They dropped all the teeny tiny excerpts where they really knew that they were going to lose. And they also wanted to bump that average over 10 because that's the kind of magic threshold, apparently. Um, so that's how we got down to 75. And then our tiny purple dot represents the five infringements that they were able to prove. So, you know, some heartening numbers there that of this whole universe, they picked their, they picked their best 99. And then of that 99, they winnowed it down even further to their best 75. And of that 75, they could only prove five. Um, so it's a pretty dramatic um, loss narrative there. So then Judge, uh, Judge, Owen, excuse me, Judge Evans also told us that the publisher revenue from academic licensing of excerpts is 0.25% of total revenue. So that's that little bitty pencil line slice coming out of the pie, right? So the idea, as Judge Evans said, that, you know, if academic licensing were just to cease to exist, if they never made another penny on academic licensing, um, that piece of the pie, uh, you probably wouldn't even notice it missing. Um, and the next slide is kind of funny. I, I tried to make a pie chart that showed the proven lost revenue is about $750, right? Those five excerpts, if Georgia State had license them as the judge ultimately decided they should have, um, it would have uh, given the publishers about 750 bucks, which um, is 0.00015% of their overall aggregate revenue, right? Um, it's sort of, uh, it's a, it just gives you an idea of it's really not about the money here, or at least it's not about what they could prove they lost, because um, they, they lost a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of their total revenue. And I want to talk about one last thing that's not numbers, it's the code, uh, because it's, the ARL has, has worked very hard with the library community to talk about fair use in new ways in recent years um, and to provide a tool that we think is extraordinarily useful um, for you guys um, in knowing how to apply your fair use rights to particular situations. And the code is, uh, uh, of course, should be anyway responsive to changes in the law. Um, but in this case, uh, so in this case, right, what happens to the code given that there is a decision that affects um, the same phenomena that the code addresses in principle one? Well, it turns out first that there's different reasoning, right? So she dismisses transformativeness, um, which is, you know, a problem. Um, and she also doesn't seem to really care what people are doing, which is also a problem. Most judges typically do care what the community is thinking. Um, but in reality, the decision didn't come out terribly differently in practice than the code would. Um, there are many commonalities in the way that the judge is thinking um, and the way that the code of fair use thinks. So the purpose, again, is at the core of fair use. Um, you should tailor your use to your audience and purpose. More modest use should be made of works whose core audience is a classroom use. All of these things are represented in the code, and, and all of these things are represented in the decision. Um, one thing, though, is that the code applies to all media. And as I mentioned earlier, there's really nothing in the decision to give you guidance if you're talking about audio, video, um, or popular materials as opposed to scholarly materials. So the code is going to give you some help in those areas where the Georgia State decision really didn't. Um, so that, that concludes the sort of run through there. And I think we can take maybe a couple of final questions. Well, this one's for Jonathan. and. Um, 
he asks, do you believe that the de minimis portion of the decision gives libraries broader leeway when digitizing material for storage in a dark archive when that digitization falls outside of 108? Yes, I, I certainly think so. Uh, you know, because again, what, what, uh, what uh, as Brandon said when he was talking about the de minimis um, uh, uh, holding, I mean, the court sort of said, well, look, I don't care about the fact that this work was sort of scanned and uploaded. If no one ever downloaded it, uh, you know, no one ever saw it, and so, so you know, no harm, no foul. Um, and certainly, if you think uh, then in terms of um, a dark archive where you would have something scanned uh, but then never uh, not not viewed uh, then then again if no one's seeing it why why do you even need to think about it why you don't really need to care about what's going on behind the curtain and I think that that that's a very important ruling um, I think that it's uh, you know it, it does reflect uh, the thinking of some other uh, courts um, uh, in in other kinds of cases uh, de dealing uh, with technology, where again they sort of don't really care what happens behind the curtain, um, and 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 it could conceivably even have implications for let's say the Hathi Trust litigation, where there's um, you know uh, until someone sees the work, it really doesn't matter uh, what what uh, what kind of you know whether it's one digital copy or a hundred digital copies. You know, behind you know, that's not not accessed by anyone. It really, it really doesn't count. So I, I think that uh, that, that, that that does uh, that, that is a very helpful ruling for us. Jonathan, do you believe that this? Um, the question has been asked whether you believe this is um, sets precedent or not. Well, sure, it sets a precedent. I mean, every every decision uh, is is by definition a precedent. Uh, the the the. the the question is, is it a binding precedent? Uh, and it's, it's uh, not a binding precedent. It's not like a Supreme Court decision, which is binding on the whole country, or, a, or a, this, uh, an appellate decision, which is binding on all courts within the district. You know, this is uh, uh, just what one judge thought about one set of facts. Now, that's uh, uh, so certainly will be something that people will look at, and they, they should look at it. And, and again, it was uh, and, and it will be given weight uh, by other courts as nothing else because it's so long. Um, uh, but, uh, the, you know, so there's a lot of paper there, so it weighs a lot. Um, but even beyond that, I mean, the judge was very thorough uh, in, in her analysis. Um, and, and so I think other judges will, uh, will look to that. But, they're, you know, it, it's, it's not dispositive. It's not binding. Um, and I think that... Uh, uh, um, you know, everyone when they when they are sort of saying, okay, well, now how do I think about this? Uh, how do I use it? I think, as, as we've said, it's it's sort of uh, helpful. It's interesting, but you know, ultimately, uh, people will have to sort of do their own uh, fair use analysis. Um, you know, uh, and and uh, and keep uh, you know, keep what they think applies to their circumstance, and if there are things that they think uh, don't necessarily, uh, then, then you, know, they, you know, as long as they have a, a sound basis for doing so, then, then they should. I think it's important to stress that you know, we've talked a lot about how the court did have somewhat of a mechanical approach, sort of marching through these four factors and then sort of the weighing, you know, the two factors as opposed, you know, then doing this, you know, if you have three to one, then you win, or if it's one to three, then you lose, and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but, but, but to some extent, that's how the case was litigated. I mean, that was uh, that was the the, the the Georgia state policy um, uh, sort of did take the checklist approach, um, and and that's you know and that's perfectly fine. That's how Georgia state that's a, the, the the policy Georgia state decided to adopt, and that was the st litigation strategy they chose to follow. But but there are other policies that might not be not necessarily follow the, the sort of the checklist approach and, and that's perfectly fine um, and and uh, you know the courts could uh, 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 you know those policies could be defended in court if they're ever challenged in a, in a slightly different way
so one last question, and um, there are a huge number of questions, and we recognize that, so we will try and find some way to answer these in blogs or in some other capacity. But a question comes up about next steps in terms of can Georgia State wait to see if the publishers appeal, and then if they do, can they, Georgia State, cross-appeal the 10% limit? Um, you know, probably, I think technically they might be able to because usually, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, completely, I don't have the, all the rules at my fingertip, but, you know, if Georgia State, if, if the publishers notice an appeal, um, uh, you know, then, 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 you know, Georgia State can notice the cross appeal. Uh, now, now, you know, I suppose it's possible that the Georgia, that the publishers might wait until the very last instant. It'll sort of like, like be a, you know, a bid on eBay where you, you know, put your bid right at the last instant. So it could be that, that, that the time would uh, expire if they kind of wait till absolutely the last minute, uh, and then the. Uh, but you know, usually a, an appeal is simply filing a piece of paper. Uh, you don't, uh, you know, to notice the appeal. Um, but but I suppose even then, you probably could ask leave to file a cross appeal out of time if the publishers were to wait until, you know, uh, absolutely the last uh, the last second before they they file their notice. Um, uh, you know, you can you can always appeal out of time, and I would think that if you're a state institution, uh, uh, a court would likely uh, look favorably on on such a such a motion. Well, my thanks to to Brandon and to Jonathan. We've run out of time. In fact, we're a little over time. Um, again, this will be up on the air website sometime after the long weekend. Um, and it's on the Infinite Conferencing System. It will be archived there as well. Um, I thank you very much for joining us today. This was, um, I think, as Jonathan and Brandon will see when we get off, there have been a huge amount of questions that, that have been raised. And obviously the interest is very, very strong, and this conversation will continue for quite some time. So thank you, everybody, and um, good afternoon. Thank you. That does conclude today's webcast. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines and have a great day.